Kia ora tato. Welcome uh, everybody and uh, it's, I'm delighted to be here. Well, connected, thriving, vibrant Manawatu, the best rural lifestyle in New Zealand. <laughs> I, well, we're pretty well on the way to achieving our vision and I certainly believe that we have not only the recipe for prosperity, but also for resilience. Manawatu district uh, runs from mountain to sea, from Rangawahi in the north here, uh, right down to Himatangi and Tangimuana in the south. We've got a population that I think many of you would envy. It's 30,000, and we have 15,000 of those live in a town called Fielding, an award-winning town that has no parking meters and no traffic lights. <laughs> and we have another 15 that live in the rural hinterland. And those 15,000 live in roughly 13 villages, which number from about 100 to 500 in number. We actually have more sheep than people. And we have probably, uh, in conjunction with our neighbours in um, Rangitiki, we have the largest number of sheep and beef uh, farming in, the, in, the, um, in New Zealand, actually. And what's interesting about this is that it's forced us to look at our prosperity in relation to our neighbours. And I think one of the great things today about resilient communities is that if there's no collaboration, then there will be no resilience. And so we have um, underpinning our economy this very thriving uh, and amazing iconic sail yards, over 140 years old now and only 50 metres from the town square. We have between 60 and 120 trucks on a Friday pouring into fielding, um, truck and trailers, and we also um, of course have it by evening a smell within the town um, that I have to tell my sisters who are in Hamilton that that's the smell of liquid gold so breathe it in and sniff it up. <laughs> and in fact this underpins our economy because five million can turn over there in one Friday and frequently more. And of these sheep um, maybe 27,000 in the high season will be killed at one of our um, meat processing companies, of which we have two. But I think the secret that underpins our region are these villages. And we have um, an amazing intergenerational capacity to care. We have values that were once old and are now new. We have in these villages a community development plan that council has uh, initiated with Boffa Miskel. And so each of our 15, 13 to 15 um, villages have had this uh, facilitation process of five or six workshops where they've developed their own vision, developed their own themes, developed their own action plan for over 30 years. And this aligns with our council plans and they take responsibility and ownership for that. I have a great council, and of my 10 councillors, they share these 13 villages as a liaison once a month with the council. We're between two rivers, the Mighty Manawatu and the Rangitike, and we're extremely fortunate with our soils, 18% class one and 14% class two. And as I said, we have the high country through to the plains. We would have to be probably the most favoured part of New Zealand in terms of what climate change may bring to us. We don't take it for granted. And in 2015, this is um, what happens when you live in the high country and isolation to some of those communities can happen overnight. With forest slash, we can damage our amazing roading infrastructure and our bridges can be taken out. We can see 
um, stock banks collapsing, and we can see our um, spillways rushing, um, fortunately, um, through the uh, ad addition of these amazing gates and through um, floodgates on our Makino stream, we're now able to protect the town of Fielding, 15,000. One of the ways that we are building resilience, and I believe strongly in this, is about resilient individuals. Resilient individuals make up resilient communities. And recently, we have launched a new strategy and framework called Talent Central. And here we have a student from Fielding High School, a robotic champion. Three years in a row, they've won the world robotic title this year at Kentucky, who's designed a robot here to be working in the um, context of agriculture, talking to the infrastructure manager of our council and how maybe robotics can be used within the emergency management strategy. This Talent Central framework starts at early childhood, and there are three aspects, three pillars. There's a pathways pillar, which is about connecting students and schools to employment. There's an innovation pillar, which runs from early childhood right through to adults, and there's a leadership pathway. This is a new initiative around social socks, and this operates in preschool and some of our primary schools, where a group of dedicated social workers are giving back and encouraging children to make their own socks and to externalise their feelings and share what it means to them when disaster happens. Similarly, we're investing in an engineering in schools programme, again, Eight or ten of the volunteers are engineering students from Massey working here with Fielding Intermediate. This is all about adapting, adapting our thinking because we need a new mindset if we're to deal with the, some of the issues that we're going to face in the future. And so here the students have been looking at problem solving in local scenarios around infrastructure and also around food technology. Instead of having a youth council, I've introduced um, Manawatu Youth Ambassadors. So I have about 25, 12 to 25 year olds who select themselves through an interesting process about how they would engage the community for now and in the future. And these young people have tackled issues such as youth obesity, bullying in schools, and they've also um, recently launched a bystander program in association with the bullying, which they are themselves taking part in um, primary schools. If I come back to the um, resilient communities and those community development plans, this is a, um, this is a community called Helcom of about 500 people. And because we um, spend most of our council budget on roading and the three waters, over 70% of it, there isn't a lot left to divvy up between communities. But with this community development plan and its associated community response plan, these people take ownership themselves and they've built this walkway. And the point is that they have not only um, planted everything there, but they actually cleared the land with a a um, member of the community who lost his wife in, the, um, in a terrible accident across the railway crossing. Because this community cared for him, he in turn gave back 460 tonnes of this mulch and weeks of clearing that land for them. Similarly, a member of the Rangitiki aggregates was also, his wife faced a disaster and the community rallied round him, so he came with all the material for the walkway. What happens in a community like this is that you not only are building resilience, but you're building a sense of mental health and well-being. So one of the problem women in the community that's been um, a very difficult person has suddenly found her niche in caring for a small part of this walkway. And she gets up at 4.30, because she used to get up and create havoc at that hour for many neighbours. She's now out there tending, planting, spraying on the walkway. What about cultural resilience? 
we've got a Bhutanese community in our uh, neck of the woods, and they've got some relatives over in Palmerston North. And recently, over the last two years, I have been privileged to bring um, New Zealand citizenship on 25 of these people. We differ with them, not only culturally, but more importantly, in language. So communication is difficult. So how do we do that? I don't think I've hugged more people in public than I have Bhutanese. So a hug is how I communicate with them, wherever, in the supermarket, down the street, or if I'm sitting on a box in their driveway watching them celebrate their festival in their makeshift garage with their beautiful costumes and some old curtain hanging up. But these people need translators. And so one of the ways that we need to build resilience is about communicating with people in their own language and celebrating their customs. And what about our own iwi? Our mana whanua are the Ngāti Kauwhata. Our council has actually um, Namanu Taiko, which is 10 up to 15 actually marais are in our region. And so we have representatives of those on that uh, council. But in addition, we have been working with Ngāti Kauwhata because we share the hour. And recently, Sir Mason and I signed a declaration on the Aurora River that has united us in caring for it for generations to come. And this supersedes any stuff that goes on in the environment court. It's about embracing a larger picture. It's about committing to working together, however difficult that may be. And then what about our own staff and our own emergency management? In Manawatu District, we encourage all our staff members, in fact, it's in their job description, to take a course in emergency management. And we're particularly lucky that they do. So on June the 15th, when we had headquarters set up in the council last year, just nearly a year ago, it was a privilege to share in watching and observing how these teams came together. We actually use EMIS, believe it or not, the Emergency Management Information System, which some of you will chuckle about. But we are the only council, I'm told, in the country that has used this and use it successfully. And Jed Shirley's nodding his head down there, and I know Ian Wilson will be thumbs up, and Ross Brannigan if he's here. And um, I want to say that when I first became mayor, it was Shane Bailey who, after only a week, came to tell me what would happen if I had to declare an emergency. He promptly beggared off to Wellington after that, <laughs> just when I thought that I had the A team in place. And then Mitchell Brown, our extraordinary team of volunteer firefighters, which we never seem to have a vacancy, do we, Mitch? In our area, we're extraordinarily privileged, but he also beggared off and left us. But such was their leadership and such was their management that We've taken up the cudgels. We've got an extraordinary relationship with our regional council, and we're very lucky about how we um, together face any crisis. And at this point, I do want to refer to the police, and I want to refer to um, neighbourhood support. I seem to be in line with a lot of other people speaking here this morning, and we are losing our police as well. But with our neighbourhood support, which is now very visible in the market every Friday, we have a growing number, an extraordinary email tree. We have parties in Accolade Grove, which is a very new subdivision. And the people down there not only have drinksies on Friday, and the ex-mayor of Rangatiki is amongst them, but they've purloined this um, empty section at the end of the street to which they wanted me to open their little Accolade Park and they came to council for a little bit of money to mow these, the, the lawns, it's a bit rough. But they've sprayed it, they've watered it, they've planted trees on this empty section. We've had to tell the developer that we've borrowed it as a park for the kids to kick a ball around in. But that's the kind of thing that builds community resilience. And at the uh, annual plan submission the other day, we had what was called teapot arrived, and there were about six 
people, all over the age of 75, I might say, who their homes border Timona Park. And they have called themselves the Timona Park Orchard Trust. And they go through, they've all cut little gateways, and they go through to the park, they've planted a whole lot of orchard trees, and they're working with our contractor, um, keeping these and growing them, making crab apple jelly, giving it away to neighbours and friends. And one of the other things that's really important is for young people to be able to celebrate their successes and to be part of what I call civic pride. So this is a group of young children who won a jump jam um, competition for uh, several years and were chosen to perform in front of the royals. But it, that's not the main thing about it. These kids are all little Enviro ambassadors. And in their own areas, this is a country school, they have built um, amazing riparian strips with local farmers. Uh, they've got their own little uh, village gardens. And they are, to me, our future in terms of resilience. Just as these people are, these are young, again, 11-year-olds, who are thinking about new ways of solving problems. And that's the kind of mentality that we want today. I think one of the things that I've said to these young people is that in a crisis, it isn't about business as usual. We all suffer in a crisis. And I think that it's, we've got this saying about get back on the horse. And one of the things that I've discussed with this particular group of kids is what that means. How do we get back on a horse or how long does it take to bounce back? My daughter was on the top of the CTV in Christchurch in the earthquake and one of the nine survivors. And she was a counsellor. So she knows all about what it means to care for people in trauma. But she realised she had to care for herself first. And after huge pressures from relationship services to go back and counsel these people who all had suffered the earthquake, she took herself out for six months so that she could deal with her own trauma, so that she could choose her response. And I'm pleased to say that she is more resilient than ever as a result of that. So when the road is closed ahead through adversity, I think it's really important that we develop a mindset around resilience, which is, it's not what happens without us, but it's what happens within. And I think that um, I've shared with you how old values and new values are one and the same thing. And I'm going to suggest a very new mantra, but it's 2,000 years old. Love thy neighbour.